Hello and welcome to Re-Earthing. Recently I was at the local library uh, looking for a book about Vancouver Island in British Columbia and uh, in one of those aisles there was a cart full of books waiting to be put back on the shelves. And uh, then I noticed a book called Rewilding Our Hearts, uh, written by Mark Beckhoff. And uh, that was really interesting. Uh, so I immediately grabbed that book, borrowed it, and uh, after reading just a few pages, I knew right away that this is the one kind of a book. And uh, so I go online uh, to find out more about the author. and. What I've learned was even more astonishing. Mark is a scientist, animal behaviorist, professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado, co-founder of Ethologists for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, the organization he co-founded with Jane Goodall, author of many other books on animal behavior and nature, and <laughs> the list goes on. And uh, I am so excited to be online with Mark Beckoff. So hello Mark, good afternoon and many greetings to Boulder, Colorado. Yes, it's good to be here, Paul. We've got a beautiful day. It's probably about 22 degrees centigrade and not a cloud in the sky as usual. Oh, <laughs> the, I'm envious a little bit because uh, I'm pretty chilly uh, here on Vancouver Island, but uh, I don't complain about weather. I think whatever it is, then it's always good. So, <laughs> so it's really a pleasure to, to chatting with you, Mark. I'm so excited. Um, and my first question, obviously, you've been studying animals and they, their behavior. Uh, you were part of many amazing projects worldwide. But uh, how did your relationship with nature start? Can, can you recall that event? Yeah, I mean, there were a series of events. I, I grew up, well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, in a, and we lived in an apartment on, you know, basically a city block, but I always used to talk to the animals there. There were squirrels and various birds and some insects. And my folks told me that from the time that I was really young, I was always asking them what other animals were feeling and what they were thinking. So, although I grew up in, you know, basically a concrete jungle mm -hmm. and in, a, a big, in a big brick apartment house, mm -hmm. um, I just felt drawn to other animals and always wanted to be outside. So, um, I think it was in my genes. I think I'm pretty much a mm -hmm. biophiliac, or you know, I, <laughs> Good. Uh, my genes. My biophilia genes really draw me towards nature, um, other animals, mm -hmm. and just being outside. Can, can we chat about Rewilding Our Hearts, your book? I, I found it an amazing book, fascinating. You. And you are mentioning that the animals can feel, and that they have emotions, that they can be compassionate. Um, and there were some surprising statements as for example, that rats avoid causing pain to others, which was very surprising. Could you share with us some of your studies that you have done and experiments that really made you feel or think, okay, the animals really are sentient beings? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really do any experiments. I, my, my work was a long-term field project of coyotes living in the Green, Grand Teton National Park outside of Jackson, Wyoming, and I studied penguins in Antarctica. Um, I studied free-ranging dogs in the mountains outside of Boulder and birds. So my own experiences were really observational, watching them, because I'm, I'm an ethologist. I mm -hmm. basically get paid to watch animals. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just watching them you know, it's impossible to explain their behavior without having some feeling for what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, not automatons, they're not machines. So I did a lot of work on play behavior too, where you know the animals are really enjoying themselves. And um, I, I, and then, you know, we would see observations of wild coyotes when an individual would 
leave the pack, would, you know, disappear and not come back. They obviously were missing them. They went looking for them. They、mm-hmm. looked like they were grieving.、Um, so you, you see the whole spectrum of emotions. But there is a lot of work that's、um, there's been a lot of work done on different animals like rats and rats display empathy. Rats would rather help another rat in distress than eat chocolate, for example.、Um, they they like to be tickled. They、uh, laugh. They like to play.、Wow. And we know this about rats and mice too. You know, so what we've really learned from just a whole lot of different studies are just that a wide variety of animals have very Rich and deep emotional lives, including birds and fishes and、mm-hmm. reptiles and amphibians. So, you know, the, if people want to start drawing lines, they ought not, because it's definitely、um, a dangerous thing.、Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you are using the term deep ethology.、Uh, could you could you explain exactly what it is? Well, what I call deep ethology. Sort of came from the deep ecology movement,、mm-hmm. and what I what I really mean by deep ethology in a very simple way is that you become the animal who you're studying. You you learn as much as you can about their behavior, you know how they sense the world, what their vision and、um, hearing and olfactory senses are like,、um, how they use different combination. Of the senses to interact, and then you become them. You, you know, like the sense of coyotes, you step into their paws, you you step into their heads and their hearts, and you really try to understand not only what they're doing but what they're feeling. And when I did my field work on Adelie penguins in Antarctica, I did the exact same thing. I just became a penguin as much as I can. And you know, some people they laugh and. You know, they think it's cute, and well, I mean, I suppose it's humorous to some extent. Except, there's no other way you're going to learn about the animals who you're studying、mm-hmm. unless you understand how they sense the world and you become them. So, I do a lot of work on dogs, and I recently had a book on dog behavior come out, and I spent countless hours watching dogs over decades and going to dog parks, and you know, once again, trying to. Figure out what they were thinking and what they were feeling,、mm-hmm. and you know why they were interacting with other dogs. Say, for example, in the ways they were.、Mm-hmm. And are you just using the results from the observation and and from the knowledge,、uh, scientific knowledge, or is there any other element of consciousness that you kind of let in during the well, process? Well, in what I call common sense. <laughs> Or, you know, folk psychology. People call it. I mean, you know, I always say the plural of anecdote is data. And when I have fifty or a hundred stories of some observations, then it's really time to study them. And I'm a really big fan of what people are calling citizen science. You know, just people who are really interested in an animal, and they record. Videos, or they record, you know, some、mm-hmm. information by hand, and they try to explain the behavior not in a scientific way, but just in a, a purely observational way. And, and observation is science, but you know, these are people who say who haven't been trained as ethologists. But like I said, you know, when people just start describing behavior、mm-hmm. and describing different social interaction patterns. And you've got fifty or a hundred of them. It's time to study it more systematically, if you can. And sometimes you just have to say that, you know, this is all we have. But there's no reason to doubt that the animals、mm-hmm. have these feelings and they use these feelings in their social interactions.、Mm-hmm. What was? Why, why did you have the urge to write、uh, "Rewilding Our Hearts"? What was kind of the driving force? Well, I've really been writing that book for a, real, a very long time, actually, and I had notes all over the place. You know,、um, I just every time I go outside, or like I'm sitting and talking to you now, 
and I'm looking out of my window at the front range of the uh, mountains that surround Boulder, and a crow just flew by, and there's some birds and a lizard, and I just had all these personal interactions in terms of just being outside and cycling and hiking and running and you know doing other activities outside, but also studying animals mm -hmm. and so. I finally just wanted to sit down because, number one, I thought I had something to say about sharing stories and the latest, you know, scientific information about how important it is to get outside. But also, I wanted people to become more activists. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to realize that they can take the feelings they have in their heart as they reconnect or connect with nature, and then let their rewilded heart motivate them to do something for other animals and other nature. So it's kind of having a, what I would call a revolution of heart, where you, where you let your feelings guide you in terms of making the world a better place for all beings, non-human and human and all habitats. Mm -hmm. So that's really what got me going. And, um, I thought it was going to be an easy book to write, but every time I write a book, I think it's going to be easier than it ever is. <laughs> but um, it's not that it's arduous and it's bad, but it takes a lot to write a book. But this one was this one was easy in the sense of having, the, if you will, the permission from my editors and my publisher, you know, to really just talk about feelings, but also to just tell people, not not in a gloom and doom way, but that we're harming the earth. The, you know, the, our planet is getting very tired and it's not as resilient as it's been. And we need to do something to stop that process. To be made, we're not going to go back to what was. I mean, and that's not even a dream of mine because it's impossible. Mm -hmm. But we need to stop the harm and the damage we're causing to the um, planet. And one way to do it is for people to undergo a spiritual and a personal transformation, which really centers on once again rewilding their heart and using those feelings to do something good for the planet. Yeah, that, that was really the most powerful thing that resonated with kind of my philosophy. That when you mentioned that, uh, yeah, we really have to introduce the our intuition uh, and our kind of spiritual part, spirituality part, uh, in order to like because that's the only option how we can stop this madness. I think if we connect with nature in in a personal way, right? Yeah, and that's a great way to put it, Paul. It's reconnect. Or connect for the first time mm -hmm. in a very personal way. Each individual will do it differently. I might do it differently um, from the way you would, but we're all motivated by using our feelings and the information we have to make the world a better place. So yeah, that's exactly that's mm -hmm. a great way to put it. Yeah. Another word that you use it's an ignorance, uh, right? We are ignorant to to some point uh, that we don't really see things and we don't even think about i guess what we are causing and uh, like for example the that staggering numbers that you presented uh, you know of animals being slaughtered that was something i just could not comprehend and obviously that's a scale right like that you don't even think about it uh, in, in daily lives and that's really part of ignorance you know so, yeah When, when I talk to people about it, they're astounded when they hear the numbers. Yeah. Um, you know, they're also astounded by what is happening to our planet um, yeah. in the, you know, it's called the Anthropocene now, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the age of humanity, and I call it the rage of inhumanity because we're being very inhumane to other animal beings, but also to landscapes and different um, habitats yep. a lot of people are not aware of what's going on and we're great at denying it I, I <laughs> introduced the term in the book homo denialist to talk about human instead of homo sapien mm -hmm. because 
because we're really good at denying it. And I, and I don't say that as a criticism. You know, one of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, people or a lot of people are just so busy trying to get through the day mm-hmm. and they just, you know, if they could do something, they would. Oftentimes they just can't. They don't have the time, the energy, the money, or any other resources that they need. Mm-hmm. But being aware, it, that's the first thing. Being aware of what's happening is critical. And if you're aware and you don't do, any, do something about the state of the planet, um, that's not good news. So I always like to say, and I'm careful to say that if somebody can do something, mm-hmm. then they have to do something. Because you know as well as I know, there's a lot of people, and you know, when, we can't think of it from just a Western perspective. Mm-hmm. There's huge numbers of people in developing countries throughout the world who are just lucky to get through a day. So a lot of them probably would do something to help other animals in the earth, but they can't. Yeah. So if you can, you must. Mm-hmm. And you, and one of the ways to get people to do something is to make them aware, and to have them be aware of what's going on. Yeah, but but it's it's still kind of <laughs> weird in a way that you know, especially in our part of the world where we have all the resources, all the information we have it at, at, you know at the fingertips, and we see all the evidence, we see the plastic floating in the ocean, we have all that. But we still don't believe it. Yeah, and like I said, you know, a lot of people know about it, and some people just say, "Oh, well, it's really terrible," mm-hmm. and they're just expecting that somebody else will take care of it. That's you know, I've had so many people say to me, you know, "Well, I don't have the time, and I don't have the energy, blah blah blah," but um, you know, somebody else will take care of it. Mm-hmm. But you can't always. Depend on other people mm-hmm. to do the work that you can do or need to do, you know, as well. I mean, we need to also make sure that we leave a suitable place for young kids. I mean, mm-hmm. we're we're really double crossing them. You know, people bring kids into the world, and then they should be working really hard to make sure that future generations have the best world possible. Mm-hmm. And one way to do it. Is to rewild them when they're young, and I have a chapter in my book called "Rewilding the Classroom." Get them outside, get them off of whatever social media they're addicted to, and just get them outside. When I visit cities, which I don't really like to do, I'm thinking, you know, and you hear people complaining all the time, and I always think, well, do something. And I have a great story in my book about a woman who put a garden on the roof of her apartment house, and. Over time, she became the resident、um, insect and、uh, bird expert because of、mm-hmm. all the animals who came to her garden. And she wrote me an email, and she was forming a rewilding club. And not only did she learn a lot about you know the birds and the bees, if you will, but she also formed new friendships. So it was a win-win all around. Wow. So you know. Could be easier in some places than others, but we all have a heart. I mean, that's the other message. Is you know, we all have a heart. I mean, we all, you know, have feelings. Yes.、And、so, regardless of where you live, and regardless of whether you want to favor one group of animals over another, or you don't really care about animals, but you care about trees and you know natural areas,、yeah. we all have a heart, and we just need to let the feelings we have. When we're out in nature, guide us. I really believe the future will be these personal、um, and individual transformations that have everybody do something positive for the world. And it almost seems like we have no choice because、uh, it's kind of amusing when we say we need to save the planet, but I really think the planet is fine. It's us who needs kind of help because. <laughs> After we are gone, the planet just needs a few hundred years, and everything is going to be good. Yeah, I've been I've been actually thinking about an idea because of my interest in dogs. What what would the world be like for dogs without humans? And then,、mm-hmm. of course, that those thoughts and some of the notes I'm taking extend into you know what would the world be like for other animals without humans? And you're right. 
I mean, they'll do just fine. I mean, you、mm-hmm. know, domesticated animals like dogs, who really are dependent on us, you know, may have a more difficult time.、Mm-hmm. But I always say too that we do have to save the planet. But <laughs> in saving the planet, we need to save ourselves. Yes. Yes. You know, and sometimes people get it, and sometimes they don't. And I don't mean it, you know, in a snitty way. I just mean that. If we could have better relationships with the planet, and we could have better relationships with habitats and other animals, we will have we'll have a better relationship with ourselves. And when you have better relationship with yourself, you're going to have better relationships with others.、Mm-hmm. A great story. I was out riding a mountain bike, and we came across a、um, I guess sort of a small farm where there were. Um, goats playing King of the Mountain, where they jump on hay bales <laughs> and try to knock one another off. <laughs> and this gal behind me just said, "Wait, we gotta stop! Look!" What she said was so nice, <laughs> so cool. She said, "God, I've read about all this King of the Mountain stuff, but I always thought it was not true. They really do." <laughs> <laughs> so that, I mean, seriously. Well, that resulted in about a two-hour discussion we all had about different aspects of animal behavior. Because、mm-hmm. she had read about all this, like people read about different behavior patterns of dogs, but until you see it, well, and,、yeah. and in terms of rewilding our hearts, until you feel it, it's not really real. Exactly, and that just really summarizes exactly what we were talking about. It once you really experience it, then you have completely different relationship with, with absolutely. That,、right? And that's once again, you know, you know what goes around comes around. Going back to where we started, it's exactly true that rewilding and personal rewilding and the spiritual transformations of rewilding is done. By you know, it's different for all individuals, but it's allowing the feelings to predominate, if you will,、mm-hmm. and to guide our actions. It's exactly right.、Uh, Mark, what are you working on these days?、Uh, what are your plans for the future? I, I, I hope you want you want completely retired from from your work. <laughs> no, no. When I left the university, it's now like twelve. Twelve years. I wasn't retiring. I was completely just sort of reorganizing my life.、Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, gr- I mean, or re- you know, renewing certain things. I mean, I really had a great job. I didn't leave the university because I didn't like my job.、Mm-hmm. Um, well, I just had a book on dog behavior come out called Canine Confidential: Why Dogs Do What They Do, and I've got another book coming out in less than a year called Unleashing the Dog. A field guide to freedom, and it's it's almost like a guide, a Peterson's guide to animals or plants. It's kind of just a fun book where people can read it and see how they can let let dogs be dogs, let dogs express their dogness, and give them more freedom in a human-dominated world. Because that idea of what the world would be like without humans. For dogs, would be a radical change in their lives. You know, unlike, I mean, it would be a change in probably most, if not all, animals. But、um, it would be more so for dogs. And I've also been、um, working a lot on、um, the, the the idea of compassionate conservation. Or it's not an idea anymore. The field, and we just had a a very large review paper accepted in a good journal. On compassion and conservation, which is motivated basically by the、um, guiding principles: first, do no harm, and the life of every individual matters.、Mm-hmm. Um, I must have a whole lot of other projects because <laughs> I don't have a hell of a lot of free time. But、um, but but I do. I mean, I ride. I've been. I tr- I ride my bicycle. You know, I don't know. Twelve, thirteen thousand kilometers a year.、Oh. And, um, so I have time, <laughs> and, I, and I still do a lot. You know, kids programs. I I do work with Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots program, and I try to do mostly local events where we get kids、um, interested in animals, people, and the environment. So that's all part of the rewilding our heart idea. 
where where can people find more about your work or buy your book uh, or find about your uh, your projects well there's a lot of information on my home page which is just markbeckoff.com and there's a there's a tab there for books mm -hmm. and you know all booksellers carry my books so you know there's Barnes and Noble Amazon mm -hmm. um, all the publishers so um Thank goodness they're pretty easy to find. Awesome. Yeah. Mark, uh, thank you so much for this for this enjoyable conversation. Uh, it was really a pleasure. And uh, again, thanks for all your great work. And uh, keep going. <laughs> and oh, all the best to you. Thanks, Paul. I, I plan to keep going. And thank you for your interest um, in my work and asking really good questions. Uh, every time. We talk, I write down stuff, so I've got some new ideas brewing, but I can't tell you them yet because they're they're only half brewed. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you again, Mark, and have okay, a wonderful day. <laughs> bye bye.